So, yes, thank you. Okay, great. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the research data management strategies that we're working towards implementing at the university. <clears throat> so first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians and land from where we're meeting and pay respect to elders past and present, and also to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So today I'm presenting a snapshot of a very much larger evaluation um, to understand the research practices of our health and medical researchers at Griffith University. So this work was done, it's part of an ongoing evaluation, so we're still um, producing outcomes and publications from it, um, of health and medical researchers, and specifically within the Menzies Health Institute, Queensland. So this research has been a collaborative effort, and it's between myself, which is from the library, it's also between ear research services, and of course Menzies Health Institute, and also to some senior health executive members. So for that at glance, uh, we top two globally, we have over 50,000 students. Um, we have over six campuses throughout Southeast Queensland, 200,000 alumni, and an extensive network of research institutes and centres. So right now I'd like to blame, I mean, thank my <laughs> colleague, Martin Molsky, who is Director of E-Research Services, for coming up with the title of my presentation. So it's a variation of the phrase, it's the economy stupid, who was used by um, James Gabell, which was Bill Clinton's um, campaign manager for his successful candidacy for 1992. Um, so from the context of this presentation, I think Malcolm is right. It's easy for organisations and for libraries to sometimes forget um, about the research because we become so focused on the end goal of sharing and, and long-term preservation functions around data. And if you're unsure, Malcolm's not the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Malcolm was in the audience when I presented this. We had no idea. He was delighted. <laughs> 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 so for some researchers, uh, data management activities and practices are, which support uh, long-term preservation access and reuse is quite overwhelming. Often researchers have competing priorities. They're teaching, they're marking, they're grant applications or promotions around school committees and, and, and there's research as well that they're supposed to be doing. But, so they've got all this going on, but there's this general expectation that academics are supposed to know or at least heard about some of the national or international agendas that might have possible impacts, impacts rather on how it is they conduct their research. So for example, the whole redata, redata reuse conversation. Also, too, they've got requirements now from some publishers to make the data sets available when they upload their publications. And there's a the whole open access, open science, open data movement. And what about the productivity report released by the government? Will that have impact on our researchers and how it is that they're meant to conduct their research and what they're going to do with it at the end of their research? So the researchers are busy working away and they're doing their research according to the NHMRC guidelines. But there's all these other things going on that I've just mentioned that they're not really entirely sure about. So at the University, we have a best practice guidelines, which describes the attributes of responsible research practice um, and the expectations from both the Griffith uh, University researcher and also too from our university itself. But rather than got, uh, the guidelines being mandatory, they're actually just recommended at this stage. So at Griffith, we want to understand research data measurement practices of our researchers to learn more about what it is that they're doing with their data. So our study aims, we, were, we wanted to identify the gaps, needs and competencies of the group. We wanted to inform research data management training and development from the outcomes and also to encourage greater integration and reuse of data itself. So to do this, we actually investigated, we designed a survey base in consultation with the Menzies Health um, Research Leaders. That was very important. Um, and we also did a review of similar published literature. And the data was characterised, so we did it via online survey, and it compromised to five different sections and characteristics. And we also, too, related it to the various stages of the research life cycle. So our study included members from the Men's Health Institute, Queensland, which is a translational and multidisciplinary research institution. And it has four key drivers, so it's four focus points. And that's around health economics, disability rehabilitation, healthcare practice, and infectious diseases. Um, as a result um, of the attending e research, my colleague Michelle, she actually did a few um, electronic posters. So if you wanted to go to the website and have a look at it, you're welcome to post um, uh, the meeting. So she's talking more about research data to share and not to share. 
and also to create organised care and find data management practices of health and medical researchers. So overall we had 81 participants from the study and we can see a majority of them came from medical sciences followed by applied psychology and the nursing midwifery. We can also see that most of the academics the people who responded to the research survey followed them by the research fellows and HDR candidates. So as part of the survey, we specifically asked participants if they had a data management plan for their current research. So of the people we um, interviewed or surveyed, 30% said yes, they did have a data management plan, 26% were unsure, and 44% said that they didn't know, they weren't aware. So, and I don't know if you can see that clearly on your screens, everyone, but basically um, the people who did say yes, 95% of them agreed that it was good research practice to have, to have a data management plan. Of those who said no, they didn't actually know what a data management plan was. Yes. So in general, the Australian Research Code for Con um, Responsible Conduct indicates that they're required to maintain the research data for a minimum of five years, that's from the first publication date. So in this slide here, it tells us a lot of information, but it tells us where the researchers are storing the research data at key time points in the collection and analysis and preservation stage of the research life cycle. So the red bars indicate that the majority of researchers store their data on personal devices, desktops, laptops, and also two removable medias like USBs and external hard drives. So it was quite concerning, for as we know, computers fail, they crash, they get upgraded. We know that um, H drive, I mean, hard drives go missing, USBs are mislaid, so. Um, but what we find interesting, or what I'd like to suggest is I don't think that these research storage behaviours are typical to Arnie Griffith University, and nor are they typical to just the health and medical research community. <laughs> so based on this information, we were able to tell straight away that we really need to make a more targeted effort on telling researchers about where to store their data and how to do it safely. And so I guess what does all this mean? So our findings have indicated the researchers are actually struggling and identifies that assistance is required with particular tasks associated with creating the planning stage of a life cycle. Um, we also too found that there is some level of uncertainty in relation to research data management. And this obviously provides us with an opportunity to work closer with the group in developing targeted uh, services. Our findings also provide us with the confidence in where we should be directing our efforts. So in this example, the graph indicates specific areas of interest that researchers are willing to engage with. <coughs> Excuse me allowing us to provide that type of support on what it is they need to know about research data management and health group. So the top three data management practice, ethics and governance requirements, write a data management plan and then the services for data storage and backup during active projects. So this can be a topic for initial direction in applying that to the group. And of course, the rest of the remaining ones will also address at some stage. So let's say it's a work in progress. So by listening to our researchers, we're kind of taking a bottom-up approach and from LLS, we're trying to take this information on board and then we're going to use it you know, to inform our training strategies moving forward. But we're achieving this in partnership uh, with Office for Research and also to the Health ECR representatives. The Dean uh, Health for Research asked us to become involved and also to the research services. So the collaborative approach is quite ideal. So a couple of the strategies that we've done so far, uh, we held a Menzies Symposium, so we actually invited external members to come and talk to our community, the health and medical community, about what it is they needed to know. So we had Kate from uh, formerly known as ANS. She spoke about the ethical and legal issues around sharing sensitive data, particularly in the Queensland context, because I don't know if you realise that different states have different privacy agreements. And then and with health and, health and medical uh, data also, there's an issue around consent. So it gets quite tricky. Um, so Kate was very helpful in helping them go through quite a few landmines there. She also talked about data sharing and the publishing funding requirements. Um, we also had a speaker coming from QSIF, that was uh, Jeff Christensen, and he spoke about the national health facilities and high uh, computing uh, services that are available to researchers, because often research or data health researchers have a lot of data to crunch, similar to sciences. We also had our PVC come, and she spoke about open access open science and um, open data. So 
it was a, it was a good event. We're looking forward to holding more similar events, but on a smaller scale. That one was video conference to different institutions. We also invited external members from the health facilities to attend as well. So we're going to look at doing that in a smaller scale. Um, also, to the healthy data seminars. So we were approached by the, the Dean of Health to come and speak to the set series that they deliver throughout the year to the early career researchers. So what's really good about that is that we can use our findings and we can target straight away. Well, the first thing you need to know, and we'll just talk about that specifically, is around where to store your data and how to do it safely. Um, so, and then also too, we're looking at maybe targeting um, also to the HDRs as well within health group. So I mentioned um, already the bottom-up approach. So now I'd like to talk about the actual, um, the, the top-down. So at Griffith, Office for Research Director chairs the steering committee and it's looking at research data management practices at Griffith University. And membership of that includes the directors for library learning services, e-research services, and also to information technology and infrastructure, and also to the library technology services manager. So the steering committee established four working groups, and the objective is to progress data management at Griffith University. So the four groups we have are skills, um, policy, infrastructure, and services. I'm currently a member of the skills working group, and I'm on that with other representatives from both health and um, also to sciences and GGRS, which is our graduate research school. Um, so we're hoping to identify what digital skills our researchers are going to require throughout the research and the plan life cycle. And the objectives of all the working groups are the same, with um, conducting an environmental scan and also too we're holding preliminary discussions with key holders who aren't represented in the working groups. Um, the idea was there not to invite everyone because sometimes if you have everyone around the table it's very hard to keep things moving. It's probably the nicest way I could say it. Um, and then we also too are going to present an options paper with recommendations for priority areas to the steering committee who will refer it to the Griffith Research Committee. So depending on the outcome, the working groups will be able to implement plans for each activity and also to identify resources as well. And hello. Oh, I just um, oh, sorry, Julie. I just want to say that in closing, what right, sorry people, we're just gonna we're just gonna do a chair shop here. <laughs> uh, so today uh, the library's approach to advertise research data management support has been kind of generic and we've done so through the library and also to, through the educational arms of office research, but it does tend to be a little bit more too generic. So now that we've identified some key areas, we're very keen to um, use, those, um, use that information in delivering that more targeted approach around data management. So, and also too, very recently, library and learning services, um, we've had a, a slight restructure. And so now we have a research support services team, which is dedicated to supporting research, which is fantastic. Um, we've got two library research specialists in the team. I'm one, Kylie's the other one. And then we've got some 10 librarians, I believe, 10 and a learning advisor as well. And so, and we're going to be reviewing at the same time to all the research services that we're currently offering at Griffith. And with that review, we're going to look at gaps and overlaps. So we're going to look at what works well, what doesn't work well. And then we're going to also try and come up with some brilliant ideas for new research support services and deliver that sustainably as well. And I don't just mean online either. <laughs> so in taking, I'm winding up now folks, but in taking a bigger picture um, approach, I'm confident the research findings so that show us how the researchers are storing their data, in addition to where they're keen to learn more about research data management practice, in combination with steering groups' um, commitment to increasing or improving research data management practices, I'm confident that we're going to be able to offer great targeted services across not just the health and medical discipline, but perhaps all disciplines. So like I mentioned earlier, it really is a work in progress, but we're always trying to keep our research at front of mind. Okay, thank you very much, folks. I hope I didn't speak too quick. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Julie. Okay. Um, as I might throw it out to Zoomland first oh. to see it start. Face to face, thank you, that's the alternative. Oh, well, we haven't worked that out yet. Right. <laughs> when you do. When I do, <laughs> straight back to the group, I promise. But we do, we do know. But my point for mentioning is sustainability is that people often associate that with online. Yeah. And yeah. obviously we want to try and provide what we can digitally and online too. But uh, there are some things you just can't do well and it requires face-to-face. -face. So if we do target a face-to-face -face approach, then what's the best way to do it? Do you one-on-one -on -one is um, problematic? So, you know, it's developing or delivering series, you know, 
on an ongoing basis, is that is that going to help? Is there a possibility that we have a drop in uh, around where we say we're dying safely and those sort of things? So we're thinking, we're thinking about a whole lot of things, really, aren't we? Yeah, it's all it's a big picture. It's all a lot of different things happening and yeah. all coming together. Sounds great. Yeah. This is Beth from USC. I've just got a question. When we start having these discussions, the biggest negative we get is how onerous it is to fill in the data management plan. And I'm wondering what conversations you might have had around that in that space. Um, it's a good question, Beth. Um, and you're right, that's what we're here too. But at Griffith, we don't really do, we don't give them a data management plan to complete. It's not mandate that they do complete that. Curtin University do it very well. Other universities do also, where the HDRs are required to fill out a data management plan, and it's done through an online portal. Um, and they have to do that and to ensure that they get access to the research space. But I guess if you don't have the correct mandate or policies in place, that's bit, that's a challenge straight out there. Mm. Um, and there's been conversations too happening around the effectiveness on the research data management mm. plan, what that should look like, should that be a big thing. And in some conversations, or people believe that, and I do, that it should be um, shouldn't be too hard. It shouldn't mm. be such a big document, but it should be. Um, quite dynamic, so that it's going to change throughout the course of your research. So I think currently, if somebody does have to submit a plan for a, a grant submission, it can often be a paragraph, or sometimes it's a little bit more in depth, but throughout the course of the research life cycle, things change. Yeah. So it needs to be flexible, it needs to be fluid. It's a good question, Beck, and we're looking, we're actually, I just had that conversation now, we're, we're questioning, okay, do we need one? And the good thing about being involved with that research data management working group is that we've got GGRS at the table, yeah. And they can see other what other institutions are doing and yeah. and they're having they're thinking about things. Okay, thank you. Wow, that's a little bit of a different world from we we've sort of always gone down the very you know, every detail into the data management plan. Have you? Yes, rather than kind of taking a few steps back. So mm, thank you for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Oh, um, I think Jay Shree has a question. Was she left? We can't hear her, so um, you're keen not to be able to hear me. I have a question for Julie. So I just asked her to type. It. Audio is worse now. Sorry, can't hear Julie. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Um, <laughs> so is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the microphone there? Josh really was muted, but she's unmuted now, so it should be okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I think is that all the questions, folks? Oh, Jay, I'm good, thank you. Oh, okay, there we go. Great. Did you have a question? No? No, maybe not. Okay. Sandra, did you have I, I did have a question, and it relates a little bit to Beth's. Would Griffith be prepared to mandate? Do you think you're looking at that? No, that's a very good question, and I, um, I can't. I can't answer that. We would be most keen to have that as part of the policy and have a mandate. Um, but that really is for Office for Research to discuss. So as part of one of those uh, research data management working groups, there's a policy group. So that's Andrea, she's sitting on that. She runs, she, she chairs that one. Uh, so she's got her, um, she's working closely with um, her colleagues on that. And so, but, and I'm sure this is like other organisations as well, different priorities at different times and different people and developments. So mm -hmm. I know Office Research, well, her right-hand man, I guess, effectively has been moved to another area. I think it's called now the Chief of Staff from UVC. Mm -hmm. Sounds very West Wing, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a, and that's, it's frightening, really. But... <laughs> yeah, so that's a bit of a, a blow for Andrea and moving that forward. But So I guess to answer your question, if we're... Uh, the library would like to see that. What Andrew's perspective is on that, I'm not I'm sure. I can't really talk to her. But I think she's keen to, she can see what it is that we're trying to do. And, and Julie, the, and your presentation was really good. I really oh, enjoyed good. it. Thank you. Um, I should have said that up front. Oh, that's um, okay. In terms of progressing now, it mm -hmm. seems like you've got a really good collaborative approach. So not just the library, that's not just right. OR, just but. And hopefully that makes it more sustainable. Exactly right. Buying. Exactly right. And that's that's the whole reason for doing it. And that will come down to the good work between Andrew and Maureen. Yeah. Because they really do. They have a good relationship. And so I think mm -hmm. it's when you've got that opportunity to talk across the university with people who matter, uh, 
then you are able to start at least having the conversations and you can get the ball to roll. Mm -hmm. Julie, it's Jackie here. I've got a question. Uh, is most of the data as spreadsheets or are you getting um, other data in other formats? Um, spreadsheets, yes, that they used a lot. Um, also to, yeah, get, most of it is spreadsheets and survey as well, survey results. Um, but it can, that's man, primarily that. It was also to scans and images as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while since I've had a look at that particular part of the um, article. We do have a publication, it's in review at the moment. I don't know if anyone's published a paper, but like that's really quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Publish a paper, you almost like lose the world to live. <laughs> not that I'm putting anyone off trying to publish a paper. But, but it, is, it kind of is. So I haven't actually, I should be more over that question, Jackie, but yeah, I can't. I think, well, my findings are our findings. So once it's published or once it's been accepted, can you share with the group? Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Straight to Twitter. No. <laughs> yeah, happy, very happy to share. Thank you. It, uh, Antoinette here. Yes, Thank you, Julie, for that. Um, it'd be nice to share your survey as well, if you could, because oh, sure. you know, but we're always thinking we might have another survey. We haven't yep. had one since 2012. Okay. And, you know, just thinking in the back of my mind, another survey. Yeah, no, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. And there are things, lessons that we've learned from doing the survey. Yes. And um, you, you come back and you realise, oh, why didn't I ask them that question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which always happens. But I do know we asked a lot of questions, so we're yes. going to stream, streamline it. Oh, that'd be good, yeah. But another thing I can suggest is if you get an opportunity to do something like that, then do it because you, there are, so we've got one set of data and now we're able to publish from a library's perspective, but also too, we're going to publish it from a data sharing perspective as well and what the procedure barriers are as well for researchers. So, well, my publication, you know, will, will, it'll be targeted more towards library services, but there's opportunity to do, you know, cover different aspects from the one data set, so. Mm. If you can do it with somebody from one of the groups of the elements, yeah. it's, um, it's a lot easier to sort of push through. Um, and because you, 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 you were learning, and that's the reason why I approach Menzies, uh, we need to learn more about what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Menzies would like to know what it is that their research is doing. So it's kind of like a win-win for both. Oh, there's some questions. Um, do your health researchers have any concerns about protecting Indigenous data? It's from Jayshree. Um, they would have, but I don't know necessarily, um, they're very protective of their data full stop. And, and that tends to come around um, because of the consent issues. Um, and a lot of researchers are also are unsure as to what research or what consent they should be asking at the beginning of their research in order to share their data set later on down the track. So that's something that came out as part of the, of the findings. So that's another thing. When we speak to the ECRs and the health group, we can say, well, you know, if you have data and it's, you know, if it's private, you can de-anonymise it and there are still ways that you can make it available, provided it doesn't have any commercial interest or, or you know, if it, and as long as it's not doing anything unethical, then you can share that data. Um, but specifically Indigenous da data, I haven't really have come across that particular issue. But I guess in health context, that's likely to apply. hope that answers your question. Um, 81 people participated in the survey. I'm just reading the question there, sorry. That's from QUT. So Thomas? Thomas, uh, he's had some news. Oh, okay, right, okay. Oh, great presentation, Julie, thanks very much. Okay, great. Cool, okay. Um, is it more? Oh, she's just saying it keeps coming. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah. That's a very good, actually, we've, um, we do have a, a unit now that's committed to Indigenous uh, data. So if you want to have a conversation with me offline about that, maybe sometime, I'll go on a week's holiday, but I could certainly investigate that in the group context and um, have a chat with them and get back to you if you like. I have a question. Do you I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> so you said 30% said that they had data management. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm. So I actually think that that's quite high. Mm. <laughs> did you, were they? Do you? Did you find out whether they were like formal data management panels? That's the question I wanted to ask. Right. Okay. Yeah. They said there were questions in the, at the end of the survey. Yeah. Like, Why didn't I ask that? Yeah. So we asked them if they had a data management plan, but I didn't ask them what it looked oh, like, okay. or what they're doing with it, and where they. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. That's a fatal mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Great question, colleague. No, <laughs> and she's my colleague. <laughs> no, that was great. Okay, we have no more questions. So thank you very much, Julie. Yes.